You've been sold the idea that financial independence is all about some number on your account statement. Or even worse, that you don't qualify because of where you started out. That's just not true. It's not about some well-kept secret of the wealthy. It's about finding the right information and knowing how to apply it. On the Get Ready for the Future show, we're answering your questions so you can start making real financial change today. The journey to true financial independence begins right here, and it starts with you. Financial education for you to help you discover, protect, and share true financial independence. It is why the Get Ready for the Future show is on the air. So welcome in to another edition. My name is Scott Inman. Glad to have you along. John Shrewsbury is with me, one of the founders of Gen Wealth. As, get, as we get ready on the Get Ready for the Future show to answer your questions. And John, you know, it's always kind of a fun time to point out as we enter summer and we get into that vacation mindset to really think about an analogy that we use all the time here about the amount of time that people spend planning their summer vacation. And and it's always a good thing to think about that because most people do, right? I mean, uh, most people are not terribly spontaneous when it comes to their summer vacation plans. They might spend a year, you know, getting ready for that. they got to have all the things right, yeah. you know, because it's going to be the event of these of the summer. Yeah, so so in, in comparison to how much time and effort do you put forth in planning for your financial independence? Yeah, it, it, financial independence is something that doesn't just happen. Vacations can just happen, but financial independence takes planning, and I will tell you, and, and especially with the first question that we've got on the show today, Scott, is that you need to stop and get a plan. And I'll explain that after we get into the question. But the planning part of financial independence is actually a lot of fun. Uh, you may think about, well, I got to get all this stuff together and they were going to want to know all my shoe size and all this type of thing. No, we really just need some basic information to help get you a, a general plan together and then deal with the specifics as we get into the process. Yeah, that's a great point. A specific is the word I was thinking about. We get questions on the show and we want them to be as specific as possible. We have to have that, but answering that single question in a vacuum doesn't make a whole lot of sense without the broader look at your entire holistic approach. Yeah, it is all about the holistic approach and and the big picture of what's going yeah. on. The details matter. Mm -hmm. They they very much do and we want those details, but the biggest detail is you got to have a plan. Yeah. And as we get into these questions, we've got some today about uh, changing an investment strategy as you get closer to retirement. Do I need a trust? Great question ahead for that. And then about time horizon and investments. And as you plan to uh, have an in intermediate financial goal, not retirement, maybe you're saving for a down payment for a house or some other lump sum purchase, what kind of risk should you take on in that short of a term? We're going to talk about that. And the outlook for bonds and fixed income, a question about that coming up too. So there's your tease. Sat saddle up and get ready to go through the questions with us. Our first one comes from Joe via text message, and he writes to us, I'm planning to retire next year, currently 61. I have nearly $1 million total in different retirement accounts, but I'm not sure how to adjust my investments as I get ready to retire. What changes should I make to my investment strategy? Well, the first thing we'd say, Joe, as John has already alluded to, don't change anything until you make a plan. That's right. And, I, you know, Joe refers to the fact that he has uh, investments in different retirement accounts. Well, that may be okay, but everything has got to harmonize. Everything has got to work together. So that all comes under the umbrella of the plan. You may have exactly the right investments that you need to have in retirement, although if you've been accumulating, I would challenge that premise. I would say that more than likely, you need to change your investment strategy to conform itself to an income strategy as opposed to a growth strategy. And Scott, I think that people have a real hard time yeah. getting their brain around that because they've been in growth mode almost their entire life. They've been accumulating and putting money back and investing maybe aggressively over the years, but at retirement, 
it is, as Janet has said many, many times, it is like the difference in playing football and basketball. Mm-hmm. You can't play by the same rules because you get thrown out of the game. Yeah, and here, here's, the, here's the big, the big um, example of that that I've seen in the client meeting rooms when it comes to shifting that mindset is we will oftentimes see when someone comes to us the first time, if they're close to retirement, just like Joe says he's currently 61 and wants to retire next year oftentimes they'll come in and if it's a bad market year they've moved everything to cash or they've moved everything to risk off investments because their mindset is if I've saved a million dollars I can't afford to lose this because I don't have time to make it back they're thinking about their retirement accounts no matter how many there are as one number that's right. and, and that and that's the first thing that has to shift. It's not the asset number, it's the income number that matters. Well, and what they're also doing is they're fixating on that retirement date, that one right. year, and they are actually going to live probably 25 or 30 years in retirement. Right. And so you have to have different investment strategies for different time periods in retirement, and that's what the whole income for life and and uh, the uh, get ready the ready to retire process is all about, Scott, because we really do think that that retirement is not a single event it is a journey that you're taking and you need to be prepared for all aspects of that journey and that longer end of the journey quite frankly has to have an element in it of growth because inflation will demand that you have more income 15 or 20 years in retirement than you do at the start. I don't know anybody that would take a job and say, okay, I'm going to work for this amount of money for the next 25 years. Yep. And they they, they just wouldn't right. do that. Right. And you can't do that in your retirement as well. Yeah, I think about it, you know, people think about retirement as a full stop, that that's the end, but it's really just the beginning of something else. You know, I tell people all the time and when they say, well, hey, I'm not 40 anymore, I can't be in this investment strategy. Well, with a portion of your assets, you are 40 because yes. you're not going to be using those dollars as income for potentially 20 years you said it's not a full stop it is a transition yeah. it is a moving into a different phase of life but it's still active you still have all of the forces of the economy working against you if you will like inflation and, and volatility and all of that and so you have to be in a situation where you can actually uh, like i like to say you you take whatever the defense is going to give you if you if there's a hole there you want to go exploit that hole if you're an offensive coordinator and so that is something that I think most people don't think about they think that the retirement date is the end but it is simply the beginning of a new transition we call it the retirement red zone if you are five to ten years away from retirement that's when the the game changes as John has alluded to he used basketball versus football I use just football if you think about the red zone being inside the 20 yard line offensive coordinators will tell you the play calling is different the play calling is different because you have less field to work with and when you are transitioning from accumulation into distribution your investment strategy does need to change joe so let's give you a few things to think about we're not going to be specific with that because you need to make the plan before the actual investment strategy changes but broadly and generally we can talk about that so when it comes to income john the first box to check is to figure out how much required income you need on a monthly basis just to pay your basic expenses. You have to think about this in terms of what is it that you need uh, that we would call essential income. The wheels are gonna fall off the bus if you do not get this amount of money in the door every month. We need to know what that is. Now, you've obviously got social security, maybe a pension that would take up a good bit of that essential income amount. But there's usually a gap there. There's usually a deficit between what you have in guaranteed income sources in terms of pension and Social Security and what that required income need is. You also have to think about it this way. Your required income need is actually spendable money. Mm. It's not gross money, meaning before taxes. So if you need $5,000 a month, you're probably going to need a system to produce $6,000 a month before taxes. So you have the $5,000 to spend. That's rough numbers, but that's how you have to look at that. Yeah, because the major risk here, you talked about inflation risk being huge. So is longevity risk. We don't know how long someone is going to live. And Joe, you could live a long life. You might not live a long life, but I always tell my clients it's better to plan for a long life and not get it than it is to not plan for a long life and get it. So to beat longevity risk, you have to have guaranteed income 
to cover your basic expenses. Now, beyond that, once that box is checked, because you may need to use some of your retirement assets to create more guaranteed income using a product such as an annuity, which we've talked about before on the show and we can talk about again, I'm sure. But let's talk about the desired income part of that. So once that box is checked, we know your bills are going to be paid with guaranteed monthly income. What about the discretionary spending? And this is the dream part. What do you want to do in retirement? And putting a number to that, annual is fine, then divide it by 12. But think about your desired income and how that needs to be brought to you from an investment perspective. Yeah, Scott, oftentimes, you know, people think about their income as their income, but they, you've really bifurcated that, and that is an incredibly uh, effective way to look at this. Your desired income is something that you're going to spend, and oftentimes we think about it in terms of how much the rest of the portfolio can actually support to maximize your income. Now, a lot of people don't take the maximum amount, but we try to display for them what the portfolio could actually support. The desired income really does, uh, the, it is really the home of where our bucketing strategy aligns itself. And when we talk about a bucket, bucketing strategy, think about the timeline of your retirement from, let's say, age 60 to age 90. There's a 30 year time period. Let's break that time period down in about five year segments. And each of those five year segments needs to have a portion of your desired income money allocated to that desired income segment so that you can then invest according to your time horizon. For instance, money that you're going to use in the first five years of retirement to do your trips and things of that nature, that needs a very short time horizon, a very conservative time horizon. The money that you're going to need 15, 20, 25 years down the road, you probably want to invest that in equities because we need the effect of that income, uh, of that do those dollars invested in equities to have the opportunity to grow to stay ahead of inflation. Scott, we've got a great graphic on the bucketing strategy that I think is really important for people to take a look at. When you think about this, if you align those buckets along a timeline, then the left side of the bucket strategy is low risk. That's money that you're going to use now or soon. At the opposite end of the bucketing array is the aggressive part of that. That is money you're going to use way later. That's money that needs to grow so that you can increase your income in 10, 15, 20 years down into your retirement. The middle bucket is a hybrid bucket. And you think about that uh, with investments like real estate or a balanced investment portfolio that has some characteristics of stocks, some characteristics of bonds that create income. That hybrid bucket is a bit of a pivot and that sits right in the middle. And that's more like a 10 year time horizon that you would use that hybrid bucket. But that's the strategy that we would use. And then if you're watching on uh, Facebook or YouTube, you see we have arrows coming out of some of those buckets and going into the low risk bucket. Mm -hmm. What that really means is that we are actually harvesting gains from the hybrid and aggressive buckets into the low risk bucket. Because think about it, Scott, if you are, let's say 65 years old or 70 years old, and you have a big gain in your equity bucket, if you leave it alone, it might disappear. Yeah. And you might not have the time to get it back. Right. You may pass away before the, the, the market ever recovers. And so you want to take that money off the table, so to speak, and put it and bank it into that less aggressive bucket, those, those conservative buckets, the low risk buckets, so that you can use that money to do the things that you want and need to do in your retirement. So to wrap up, Joe, you need to be ready to retire. At GenWealth, we have the ready to retire process. And this is for Joe and anyone listening who's walking up into that retirement red zone. Walk through that with a GenWealth financial advisor. You can call us toll free 866-653-PLAN. That's 866-653-7526. Or send us an email, show at getreadyforthefuture.com and tell us you want to go through the Gen Wealth Ready to Retire process. It's a planning process, and it can be a first appointment. And if you decide you don't want to go through that process, it's not going to cost you a dime. But we can talk to you about your goals, get a little information from you, and see if we're a good fit to work for and with you. 
Can you tell we like that question? That's what we do every yeah, day we just, here. We kept out on that for Half 10 minutes. the show <laughs> on that question. We may be dropping one, Casey. I can tell you that right now. Let's go to the second one, though. Maya from Little Rock, 49 with three children, $150,000 left to pay on a $490,000 house, 50000 in savings, around 245000 toward retwi- retirement, and each kiddo has a 529 plan. Beneficiaries are named, but I don't know if that's enough. Do I need a will, a trust, or both? My great question, and we do believe you need to go through some estate planning. Everyone needs to consult with an estate planning attorney if they have any assets that are going to transition potentially to the next generation. But the first thing I would ask you is, do you have a retirement plan? Looks like you've done a lot of things well here. You've paid down your house substantially prior to age 50. Uh, you have a solid emergency fund, maybe even too much uh, in cash with $50,000, unless you have a big purchase coming up soon. But do you know if you're on track with your retirement savings? I look at the $245,000, do not know when you want to retire, but you're almost at fifty. How much are you contributing to that? And how do you know that you're going to end up at an asset level that's going to provide you the income in the way that we just talked about through that strategy, the bucketing strategy? So I would encourage you to get a plan, first of all. But then to the estate planning part of that question, John, if you don't have a will, at at very least, that should be the basic thing that you do. Yeah, if you don't have a will, the state has one for you. There are state intestacy laws that basically say that if you die without a will, here's how your assets are going to be divided. And it's black letter state law, and that's how the court would actually take care of it. If you have a will, then that's going to direct how your assets are going to be uh, apportioned out to your family, but it also is going to almost guarantee that you will go through probate. Unless you have a very small estate, you will actually go through probate in order to make that will effective. Now, what a trust does is it actually takes assets, puts it in the name of the trust, and the trust is a living document that lives forever, basically. And that trust is actually something that you can uh, use to send those assets to the people that you want them to go to without having to go through probate. Probate is a very expensive process. It can cost up to 3% Mm -hmm. of your estate in the state of Arkansas. And so there are things there that you want to try to avoid. Now, a couple of uh, points here. If you have an account that has a beneficiary named on it, then you don't need to put that in the name of the trust because it passes by act of law to your beneficiary. It bypasses the whole estate planning process and goes by contract to your beneficiary. However, if you don't want that beneficiary to have all the money at once, then you would need a trust to actually regulate how that money is apportioned out to that person. But I would say that that sitting down with a good estate planning attorney would allow you to understand the ins and outs of this. A trust is, is something that a lot of people are told that they need. Sometimes they do, sometimes mm-hmm. they don't. It is very situational to a person's particular financial uh problem that they're trying to address yeah let me add this too because she says she's 49 with three children i think that's an even key part of this equation i think to my own personal situation there i have children some are now under 18 we we created the trust when they were all under 18 and the reason being john's already mentioned it if you name the beneficiary or or if a beneficiary is named do you want to hand all of that over to more than likely your spouse if you're married will be your primary beneficiary but as a contingent if you're spouse predeceased you or you both died at the same time would you want all of that money to go to your children especially if they're not 18 most likely the answer to that question is no so the trust allows you to divvy that out and give uh, distributions at your choice of time frames for us it was the first stop was 25 years old with a college degree i wanted them to have a college degree then it was 30 years old then it was 35 so it split it out in timelines right. to allow them to not Uh, have to or get to receive it all at once. So I think that's a great uh, option for you just from that standpoint, above and beyond the advantages of 
uh, avoiding probate and getting through that process cleaner. Yeah, and, and this is where I think that you need to work with someone who's qualified to give you estate planning advice. I, I think that there are a lot of nuances that a lot of people are going to have in their situation. In in this particular uh, caller's uh, situation, they talked about the kids having 529 plans. Yep. Well, that to me says that they're minors. Yeah. And you need to have a guardian uh, who would be a trustee for those kids to receive that money. Somebody's got to receive it when you pass away. And the kids can't take legal possession of the money if they're under 18. Yeah. Make sure, too, if you're thinking about this at this stage of life, that you're looking at a revocable uh, a trust instead yes. of an irrevocable trust. Because yes. you're going to make changes when things happen in life. And, and an ir- irrevocable trust won't allow you to do that much more difficult. So Maya, thanks for the question. Do want to remind everyone who's listening, if you heard something there, hey, that triggered maybe a thought in your mind that it, it, you don't know if your estate planning is where it needs to be, or maybe you haven't done any, you'd like to find out more. We've got another free resource for you other than the Get Ready for the Future show that you can take advantage of on June 26th, actually right here on the Get Ready for the Future show, we're going to have a special guest, estate planning attorney, Chris Rippey, who we work with quite often. He's uh, done some workshops for us. He works with many of our clients. Uh, he will be here on the show in just a couple of weeks. So if you have estate planning questions, we want you to send them in to us. You can text them at 501-381-5228. You can also call that number and leave a voicemail and ask your question. Or send a show, send a, an email to show at getreadyforthefuture.com and have your estate planning question answered by Chris Rippey on the June 26th version of the Get Ready for the Future show. Now, that is a Wednesday, so if you listen to this show on Saturday mornings on our radio, uh, our radio broadcast, that's actually going to be June 26th. Ninth, is that right? If I'm adding up real quick, right. yeah, June 29th. That's Saturday, the Saturday following June 26th. <laughs> but if you watch us live on uh, YouTube, it's going to be on June 26th. So send those questions in, uh, and Chris will be able to talk to you about estate planning in just a couple of weeks. All right. Next question from YouTube What is the minimum years you would suggest to keep the money in money market versus stock market? Is it okay for me to save money in money market for home purchase down payment in five years? Absolutely. Absolutely, it's okay. And absolutely, I would say in five years, you certainly wouldn't want to save that exclusively in the stock market. Now, there are other options in between no risk and more risk uh, that you might want to look at. But certainly with where interest rates are right now, it might make sense to keep that in CDs or in a money market. And when she says money market, now it depends on the interest rate there. There might be more attractive interest rates in other options as well. Yeah, there are a couple things that I would say here. Obviously, a money market account is going to pay you interest. Money market accounts are not FDIC insured. However, they do pay a very solid rate of interest, and they are very stable in terms of value. Uh, A certificate of deposit, if you know the time frame in which you're going to use it, in this case, five years, you know, you could probably look at that as as an option. Another thing you could potentially look at is maybe the bond market. Uh, There is maybe some opportunity if interest rates start coming down for there to be some appreciation on top of the coupon rate or the interest that that bond portfolio might be paying. So you could come out better there, but you do have a degree of risk there, albeit small risk in terms of bonds, but you do have a degree of risk there, Scott, that you may or may not want to take depending on how critical it is to have that set amount of money at a particular time in the future. Yeah, I think that's the key here. When it comes to investing, everything is about time horizon. So the question nails it on the head. If you need the money in five years, you are in a short time horizon. And we would not want to invest any of our client dollars in equities if they need them in less than 10. We would say 10 to 15 years is the long-term investment strategy that you should have, the long-term investment mindset that you should have if you're going to enter the stock market. A great example of how this works, history shows the most successful investors in equities buy it and leave it alone. 
Warren Buffett is a great example. Warren Buffett is not a day trader, John. That's right. And yep. there are there are things that you can really take a look at in terms of uh, probabilities of return in the market. We'll get to that in our next question, I believe. But but Scott, I think that that the one thing that you want to think about is in terms of equities. You don't want to invest anything in the stock market that you're going to need in less than 10 years. That, that's just my personal rule, is that I don't invest anybody's money in the stock market if they're going to need it in less than 10 years, because you have no idea what's going to happen. You have no idea how that volatility will play out in terms of the timing of your need for that money. That's why we talk about it in the income for life model being a long term, more aggressive position for 15 plus years down the road in your retirement to allow those equities time to do what they do, and that is grow over the long term. I think this is a good time to show that graphic. I think Casey has it for the probability of positive returns in the stock market. Now, we're using, when we say the stock market, we're using the SP 500 index, what everybody does. It's just the 500 largest companies. Uh, in the United States, roughly, and it is an index. You can't uh, invest directly into it. But if you look at the returns of the S&P 500 index since 1937, there is a 53.4% chance that it's going to be positive in any given day. Goes up to 63% chance in a month, 69.5% chance over three months, and over one year, you got a pretty good shot, 77.5%. And over a three-year term, 87.3%. But if you need money for a down payment in five years, I don't think you want 87%. You want 100% that you're going to have at least every dollar you started with. And as you see, you get to five years, you're really looking good. But you get to 10 years, you believe the probability of 97.3% of, of it being positive over a 10-year time frame, that is where you want to hang out. Scott, I've been known to play a hand or two of blackjack. And one of the things that I would love to be able to do is stack all the cards in my favor. <laughs> I would love to know exactly how those cards are going to come sequenced to, yeah. to me mm -hmm. in a blackjack game. Sure. That's just the, the, the basically the, the rules of the game. But when you're investing, what you want to do is you want to stack all the cards in your favor. What do I mean by that? Let's go back to that graphic for just a second if we can, Casey. Take a look at that 10-year time period, 97.3% of the time, looking back since 1937, if you held an investment in the S&P 500, 97.3% of the time, it's been positive in terms of return. Well, north of 10 years, I think you're pretty much stacking all the cards in your favor. Yeah. You know you're going to get a positive return because history has told us that, you know, that's how the market acts. Now, I have to qualify that and say past performance sure. is not necessarily indicative of future results, but you can look at how the market behaves and get some consistency of its performance. And so when you look long term, then you stack all the cards in your favor of possibly having a positive return regardless of of when you actually invested. This is our question of the week. We want to say congratulations. Uh, we're going to send you a free Get Ready for the Future Show Tumblr for being named the question of the week, but we need you to tell us how to send it to you. Email us. Email it to show at getreadyforthefuture.com and claim your free Tumblr. Thanks for the question. Finally, on the program, it is Brooke via email. I've got about $20,000 burning a hole in my pocket that I'll need to access in the next 10 years. She says, a.k.a. I don't need to spend it now. In the current environment, should I keep it in cash or should I look at something like a bond fund? Now, this is very similar to the last question, John, except she's got a 10-year time horizon and she is asking specifically about bond funds. So let's talk about the fundamentals of bonds. Yeah, bonds are uh, the easiest way to describe a bond is it's like a seesaw or a teeter-totter. If you can imagine on a playground, you've got the seesaw and it goes up on one end and goes down on the other end. That's how bonds actually work in comparison to interest rates or in relation to interest rates. So when you have interest rates going up like they have in the recent past, we saw bond prices actually go down. There was no place for that bond to go but down because rates had been on the floor. Rates had been 1% or 2% or something like that for a long period of time. So we all knew that when rates started up that bond prices were going to come under pressure. What happened in the last uh, couple of years or so is that rates went up a lot very quickly. 
And so bond prices came down pretty quickly. And bond investors were kind of shocked by that. It was the worst bond market in 2022, I believe it was, mm -hmm. and that we've had in quite some time. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about the dynamic of that, you have to kind of almost think about, okay, what direction is the interest rate swing going to go? Are they going to go higher? Or will they actually trend lower? Or they will, will they remain stable? And so that really does predict how your bond price is going to go. The other component of that, Scott, is the interest that is being paid on that bond, or as I alluded to before, the coupon rate. So if a bond is paying a 5% return on its coupon, then if you get some capital appreciation in that bond, then you might get 6 7 8% yeah. in that bond. If bond prices go uh, down, however, then that erodes how much interest you're paying. So yeah. if you went down by 1%, you might get that 5% interest, but your actual total return would be more like 4 because that's the dynamic of the bond market. Yeah, so the thing you should know is bonds can be volatile. They certainly were in 2022. But from this point forward, with where the interest rate environment is is headed, more than likely, it is an attractive place to be. But with the 10-year time horizon, I go back to what we talked about in the last question. You've got some opportunity to potentially take on a little equity risk. And I think maybe a balanced fund might be a good answer for you there, which has a mix of bonds and dividend-paying equities, maybe even preferred securities, because you're going to get a, a significant income stream on that. And over a 10-year time frame, I think you can make some assumptions, John, that you're going to get some capital appreciation because of the graphic we just showed. Yeah, and I, I don't necessarily think that you've got to be all in or all out right. of a money market account or, or the stock market or what have you. I think you could maybe keep a portion of the money in a money market account. It's yielding a pretty nice return. And then maybe take a sliver of it and put it more at risk, either in a bond fund or a balance fund or even maybe some equity, as long as you keep an eye on being conservative with your equity investment and that 10-year time horizon. Yeah, and just to kind of wrap up that question to give you some data behind this, uh, LPL Financial, who is our broker-dealer and we have a relationship with and have had since GenWealth uh, began, according to the LPL Research Department, over the past 40 years, bonds have averaged a 6.1% annual return versus 3.5% for cash. And over the last 38 years, bonds had better five-year returns than cash 95% of the time. So bonds do typically outperform cash over a shorter time horizon. Again, going back to your uh, disclosure earlier, past performance, not indicative of future results. But we like where bonds are right now because of the interest rates more than likely topping out uh, at, at, at their highest, at least in the near term, and potentially going down. Everybody thinks probably end of the year, early next year, that's going to happen. But even if it doesn't and it stays where it is, getting in now uh, is a favorable time to look at fixed income. But again, not just looking at fin fixed income. And we can wrap probably everything up today by talking uh, to Brooke there. He, she says she has $20,000 burning a hole in her pocket. But what else does she have going on? Yeah, and that's the other thing. I, you know, the, and you alluded to this at the top of the show. These situational questions mm -hmm. really are good, and I lo love answering these situational questions. But the encouragement we want to give Brooke or anybody else is think about the big picture. Mm -hmm. Think about the global uh, idea of your money. And I know that's probably overwhelming to a lot of people. And that's exactly why you'd want to sit down with a financial advisor, because that's how financial advisors think. They think in terms of not just a one-year performance or a one-month performance, but over decades, how are things going to be for you financially? You've got to win this big long-term game, and it's not necessarily indicative of how you play the short-term things that you do as long as you have that long-term mindset. And that is our final bell on the Get Ready for the Future show, meaning it's time to wrap this thing up. We've got a couple of minutes to do so. So, John, we'll start with your final thoughts. Well, I want to go back to the things that we talked about at the top of the show, Scott. Uh, the planning process is so critical to your financial independence. It's so critical to your financial success. Nobody starts down a journey on your summer vacation or any other kind of vacation without a roadmap or without a GPS trying to tell you where you're going. Uh, you've got to have an idea of where you're at right now and where you want to get to and what's the route to get there. That is in its very simplest terms what a financial plan is. 
working with a financial advisor, you can navigate the curves and the, the pitfalls and all of the things that might, uh, you know, come upon you in that journey. You can navigate that with the experience of a financial advisor. The financial planning process is easy. It's not something that is a, a major burden if you do it the right way with a coach and a plan. I think the number one thing, if you ask investors without a plan what they want to do with this money, they want to they want to make money, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. They right. want to, they want to grow those sure. funds, and you need that. And the proper investment strategy will help you do that. But to John's point, taking that road by just throwing money into some investments and seeing what happens and we'll see later down the road what we want to do with it is is really not the proper perspective what is the purpose for every dollar you're investing and that helps you build the plan and the plan is holistic which should include looking at your estate planning and i want to remind you in my final thought about june 26th that we will have a special guest on the Get Ready for the Future show, estate planning attorney Chris Rippey will be joining us to answer your questions. So if you have an estate planning question, send them in, 501-381-5228. And that is all the time we have for this week's Get Ready for the Future show. Really enjoy the questions. Always do, but these were really good today. Get some to us. Any question, nothing's off limits. Send it in, that same number that I told you, 501-381-5228. See you next time. The GenWealth Financial Team is available to you 24-7 at info at getreadyforthefuture.com or call our offices at 866-653-PLAN. That's 866-653-7526. You should personally consult a financial advisor before making any investment and no strategy can assure success. Securities offered through LPL Financial. Member FINRA SIPC. Investment advice offered through Independent Advisor Alliance. Independent Advisor Alliance and GenWealth Financial Advisors are separate entities from LPL Financial.